There aren't many modern games that you can genuinely say changed gaming, but Dark Souls is one of them. And everyone knows that, right? Dark Souls is hardly some hidden gem. In fact, a lot of the time it feels a bit like people can't stop talking about it. So maybe it seems a little strange for me to come in here and try to seriously state that Dark Souls, the Dark Souls, that Dark Souls, this Dark Souls, is actually underrated. But it is. Now, once upon a time, video games were hard, and there were reasons for that. Namely, that early games were heavily inspired by arcade titles, which used difficulty as a means of monetization, with fail states designed to persuade players to insert more coins. And, also without a high degree of difficulty, many older video games would be short. Too short, far too short in some cases. And so, challenging gameplay and harsh fail states were a crutch leaned upon by games of the 80s and 90s to extend playtime, and as people were used to the idea that games were meant to be difficult from arcades, people didn't see a problem with this. But then there was fire, and with fire came disparity. And games evolved. I mean, if you were to write a complete history of video games, a large section of that history would likely have to chart the various ways through which games became easier over time. They became more accessible, more convenient, more respectful of the player's time, more broadly appealing, more easy to get into, and you can see all this reflected in many of the most successful games of the 2000s. Shooters added regenerating health, horror games became action games, action games became cinematic games, MMOs courted casuals, PC-dominated genres gave up complexity to find new homes on consoles, and everything added more checkpoints, autosaves, tutorials, difficulty options, and more. Video games changed. It was evolution, progress, modernity, capitalism. And then along came Dark Souls, and it did the exact opposite. A lot of the time, the difficulty of Dark Souls dominates conversations surrounding the game, and it's not hard to see why. It provides a good example of what set Dark Souls apart from so many other games. But this is just one of many ways Dark Souls stood out. And it's just one of many ways Dark Souls rejected or subverted game design conventions of the time. And really, this story shouldn't even start with Dark Souls. Demon Souls was meant to be a failure. From Software weren't newcomers to game development. Actually, they had made 49 games prior to Demon Souls, although they were hardly a well-known name at this point, and there was a time when Demon Souls looked unlikely to change that. In fact, it was because Demon Souls development was going so poorly that the company was willing to take a major risk and hand the project over to a still relatively inexperienced developer by the name of Hidetaka Miyazaki, who was given near unprecedented freedom to do with the project what he wanted. After all, if it was already a failure, what's there to lose? And so, Demon Souls was shaped into something unlike anything else in the market at the time, all in accordance to Miyazaki's vision and in indifference to established game design trends of the era. Now, I don't know if it actually needs saying, but Demon Souls was both difficult and also punishing. Your death didn't just send you back to the start of the level and force players to recover their lost souls from where they died, it also cut your maximum health in half if you died in human form, and healing items didn't replenish on death, so you had to regularly buy or farm more, and if you died multiple times as a human, a mechanic called world tendency would lead to additional negative effects, like having the player's world invaded by deadly black phantoms. Basically, Demon's Souls was a game that liked to kick the player while they were down, and it was capable of kicking quite hard. 
The result was a world which felt genuinely dangerous, gameplay that had actual tension, and a level of overall challenge that players found deeply satisfying to overcome. Because even if older games may not have always had the best reasons for being challenging, and may not have always handled challenge in the best ways, they still realised that you could utilise challenge to improve an experience by making progress feel rewarding and making players more invested in what's happening. This is a big part of why certain games with relatively basic gameplay and little story can still hold up as enjoyable today. And yet, when Miyazaki set out to deliberately create a challenging gameplay-based experience of a kind he felt was dying out in the gaming market at the time, he still felt it necessary to hide the extent of Demon Souls' sadism from the game's publisher Sony out of fear that Sony would force them to tone the difficulty down. After all, this wasn't how games were meant to be designed these days, and for a publisher, profits are probably more important than the director's artistic vision. Still, it wasn't just the difficulty that set Demon Souls apart. In the year it released, the highest reviewed and most widely acclaimed game was Uncharted 2 Among Thieves, a game which dazzled audiences with its movie-like level of presentation and cinematic action. Now, in time, some would grow critical of this game's emulating movies approach, but not until several years later, and in many people's eyes, Uncharted 2 represented a kind of video game ideal. It was the definitive modern game that others should aspire to be like, and it delighted players and critics alike with its heavily scripted linear action, its loud and direct storytelling, and its de-emphasis on gameplay elements so as to better immerse players in what was happening on screen at any given moment. In many ways, it really was a game trying to be a movie, and doing a very good job at that. And then, you had Demon Souls, with its minimalist presentation, rarely interrupted gameplay, and cryptic, understated story. Demon Souls was quiet, lonely, oppressive. It abandoned any and all hand-holding, asking players to work things out for themselves, and not seeming concerned when they didn't. And it cared more about disempowering the player than providing any sort of traditional power fantasy. Even in its boss fights, where dangerous foes needed to be outsmarted much more often than simply outbattled. In short, it was as if Demon Souls was designed as a complete rejection of this new cinematic and accessible approach to game design. And yet, while its punishing difficulty and emphasis on gameplay could be seen as a throwback to retro games of old, in other ways Demon Souls was thoroughly modern, like in its asynchronous online systems, which allowed players to leave messages that appear in other people's worlds, as well as the way it showed brief ghost-like glimpses of people's actions and bloodstains that captured their deaths. These elements heighten the sense of a shared experience, where players might overcome the vast challenges before them through witnessing other people's failures, or just experiencing random acts of kindness. And yet, in fitting with the game's tone, Demon Souls also allowed hostile player vs player invasions, where the usual sanctity of a single player world would be infringed upon, probably against the player's wishes. And the freedom of the messaging system also meant players were just as capable of deceiving others as helping them. And so, Demon's Souls was both something entirely new, and something deeply subversive. It was a remedy for anyone who didn't like the direction gaming was going, and it was an experience unique to the market at the time. And this was reflected in its overwhelmingly positive reviews, its better-than-expected sales, and its growing and passionate fanbase. This still wasn't enough for Sony to publish the game outside Japan, however, because Sony thought the game sucked. And no, I am not exaggerating here. Former Sony president Shuhei Yoshida actually said, after dying too many times and not managing to complete the game's opening level, This is crap. This is an unbelievably bad game. And so, they wouldn't release it outside Japan. 
meaning From Software had to partner with Atlas USA to bring it to the West, where it went on to be rather successful. My favourite detail from this little story is that the game was basically already localised. There was an English translation already created by Sony to be included as a language option for Asian markets, and the game already had full English voice acting. In fact, it only had English voice acting until the PS5 remake, because From Software were on a limited budget and thought English would better suit its medieval European-inspired setting. And yet, Sony were either so convinced it would be a failure, or were so concerned about having their esteemed name seen alongside such a crap and unbelievably bad game, that they still wouldn't publish it in the West. That is how deeply Demon Souls went against gaming conventions of the time. Luckily, Demon Souls' fate was not decided by Sony, and now, with a proven track record of success, Miyazaki and From Software would begin work on an even more ambitious follow-up. So, contrary to Shuhei Yoshida's early impression, Demon Souls was good. And it was important. It was a bit of a gaming trailblazer, born of unique circumstances and a unique mind, and it may well have been the exact game that gaming needed at the time. But this video isn't called Demon Souls is Underrated. Still, you can't really tell Dark Souls' story without acknowledging how much it owed to its predecessor, because even if the two games aren't strictly related through title or lore, they do still share a lot of DNA. That said, Dark Souls did do one very important thing that Demon Souls didn't. It released on PC, and so more people had the opportunity to play it. This has meant that the importance of Demon Souls' foundation laying and innovation can sometimes be a bit overlooked. Still, nearly everything that was mentioned about Demon Souls' design still applies to Dark Souls. I mean, death was made a little bit more forgiving, but the game world became arguably even more hostile to compensate, and boss fights did become overall less focused on puzzle solving, but most things the gameplay, the lack of hand-holding, the subtle storytelling, the atmosphere, the presentation, the disempowerment, the online elements, and, of course, the difficulty, these all returned and worked for much the same reason. And, just as Demon Souls was unique and subversive for many who played it in 2009, so too was Dark Souls for many newcomers who never did or could give Demon Souls a chance. But Dark Souls wasn't just a bigger Demon Souls, and it wasn't just a slightly different Demon Souls. Instead, Dark Souls took the one single thing that Demon Souls excelled at the most, its ability to create a specific and memorable experience for the player, and then it connected that to its story's central themes, while incorporating this into every single part of its design to create one of the most cohesive, and thematically resonant games ever made. If that sounds like a confusing and or exaggerated claim, then let me see if I can convince you. I'll come back to this, but for now, there's no better place to start than the beginning of life as we know it. Dark Souls opening establishes the settings history and mythos. In the beginning, the world was unformed, covered in fog, and only inhabited by everlasting dragons, but then there was fire, and with fire came disparity. Heat and cold, life and death, light and dark, and so on. Within this flame, ancient beings found powerful souls, and with these souls they waged war, successfully, against the dragons, establishing an age of fire. And yet now, the fire is fading. In its wake, darkness is encroaching, and amongst the living are seen carriers of the Dark Sign, an undead curse whose victims are unable to die properly and will continually resurrect until they eventually lose their mind and go hollow. 
You are one such victim, and you awaken locked away in an undead asylum where you can only sit and wait for the slow decay of your sanity. Until an unknown man throws you a key, and thus your journey begins. In many RPGs, your character starts out weak, with little to their name, but in Dark Souls it feels like you start with less than nothing. Immediately after taking time to create your character, and making them look the way you want them to, Dark Souls then robs you of even this, revealing you to be this ugly, desiccated husk of a man. Your weapon is broken, your equipment is basic if you even have any, and your objective and purpose is unclear and undefined. You do still have one important thing, however, something other inhabitants of this asylum do not, which is your humanity. You are not hollow, not yet, and you're not the only one, not quite. You come to find that you owe your freedom to a random act of kindness from another undead. He is the one who has left the messages you find that act as the game's brief tutorial, and he is the one who gives you the only hint of an objective that you will find in Dark Souls' early hours, which is a mission he was on concerning a prophecy involving chosen undead that must journey to this land and ring the bells of awakening. That's about all you get by way of direction, however, and your saviour will go no further himself as a result of injury leaving you once more on your own. When it comes to storytelling, and in particular its lore, Dark Souls is often cryptic and vague, with many details only being found hidden amidst item descriptions that will largely go unread by the majority of players. And this approach ended up being surprisingly successful. Much of Dark Souls does centre on the player working things out for themselves. This applies to navigating the world, figuring out the game's mechanics, overcoming dangerous enemies and environments, and of course, understanding the story. It's an approach that fits with the game's themes. The player is meant to feel lost, they are meant to question what the point of their journey is, and they are meant to struggle to find answers. But this approach also plays into the player's imagination. This is what Miyazaki said his intent was, in a now well-known quote where he cited his inspiration for his storytelling style as coming from time spent reading as a child when he wasn't able to understand all of the text and so allowed his imagination to fill in the gaps, just like how the game invites the player to imagine and engage with its world and story on a level beyond simply listening to or reading exposition. This lack of direct storytelling also works to emphasise what is there in this world, like the rich atmosphere, or the emotions your journey evokes, or the themes which underpin it. Most locations in game have no soundtrack, and often the player's only accompaniment is the sound of their own footsteps echoing softly, reminding you how alone you really are. And even in the game's brighter and more captivating moments, it still seems like you're journeying through places long since past their prime. The fire is fading after all, and you can feel that everywhere you go. Still, if these thematic or stylistic explanations aren't convincing enough on their own, you could also make a strong argument that Dark Souls storytelling is realistic and logical even. I mean, what counts as story or lore tends to be old history, a lot of it involving beings known as gods, and the events which occurred at the beginning of life as we know it. And yet, the world you're in is dying, this age is ending, and this is a process which is already well underway. And so, this world isn't really in any state to tell its history, and there aren't necessarily many people left around here to tell it, and those who are still here may not be completely sane. <laughs> And if you do want to know more, and uncover this world's past, you'll find you have to approach this task much like you would with real life history, i.e. by looking at whatever sources and remnants and artefacts are still available, and going from there. And this may well give an incomplete picture, that can be confusing and even feature competing narratives and contradictory accounts, but that's how history actually works. 
We may well understand a lot of our own history these days, but there are still things we don't know, and people of pre-modern times would surely have understood a whole lot less. So really, the way Dark Souls communicates its history makes sense, and you could even say it's other games and works of fiction who give their audience absolute knowledge over so much of their creation, which are the unnatural ones. And yet, for as confusing and cryptic as Dark Souls' story might be, much of its symbolism, imagery and motifs are made quite easy to understand through their reliance on obvious, common-sense connections. Like fire and its importance to life, or the idea of a fading flame being tied to the end of a civilization, or darkness in how it acts as an oppositional force to fire, or the importance of souls and their connection to power and a being's essence, and, of course, hollows. Man that is no longer man, a hollow shell, lacking that which matters the most. In some ways, I think Dark Souls is a lot easier to understand than many realise, and you might not need to get all that much to get it. Still, that doesn't mean there's nothing standing in your way. Action games are hard. I mean, unless you're quite skilled, if you try to play through Devil May Cry on Dante Must Die difficulty, Dante will die. Dante will probably die a lot. Many games out there feature some type of action gameplay, and many games can be quite difficult. By comparison, you could say Dark Souls is an easy action game, because despite its fearsome reputation, its gameplay is relatively simple, and players are likely to have the hang of most of its core parts through the tutorial alone. In short, you can dodge, block, or move away from enemy attacks, and in response you have a light attack and heavy attack. There are also some spells, consumables, parrying, and backstabs, but your overall toolset is small, and executing these moves is relatively easy. Dark Souls doesn't require the player to have fast reaction times, or skillful hand-eye coordination, or mastery over complicated button inputs, or the ability to memorise long combos. In fact, Dark Souls almost feels like an anti-action game. It substitutes fast and fluid complexity for slow and methodical simplicity, and you could viably play through the entire game with dodging and light attack spam alone. Basically, the skill barrier is low, and in some ways it feels a bit like anyone could play Dark Souls, if they wanted to. So why then does Dark Souls have such a formidable reputation for difficulty? Well, it's because it's punishing, and Dark Souls is quite happy to punish players on both micro and macro scales. Each enemy attack does a lot of damage, each player mistake has the potential to cost you your life, and each death sends you back to the last bonfire, and can lead to a loss of souls. And, as both memes and marketing can attest, death comes often in Dark Souls' world. There are a lot of opportunities to make mistakes, and there are a lot of enemies trying to attack you. This gives Dark Souls a specific flavour of difficulty. It's a game where the player can feel danger all around them, and knows the consequences can be high, but they're also aware of what they need to do to survive, and they can usually recognise what they did wrong if things don't go as planned. If there is one skill that Dark Souls Combat asks of the player, it has to be decision making. Do you attack or wait? Should you dodge or block? Do you position close to an enemy or away? Is now a safe time to heal? This series of decisions that you make in each combat encounter tells the tale of your success or failure, with the outcome often resulting from the fact that each action in Dark Souls comes with a clear commitment involved, in time, stamina, or both. For example, if you attack or heal, you're locked in place while the animation plays out, meaning you're vulnerable to getting punished if you made a bad choice. But enemies are forced to play by the same rules, and you're free to take advantage of that. And while they do hit hard, they also tend to hit quite slow, even the bosses, 
with each hit being accompanied by a clearly telegraphed wind-up animation that gives players the time and information needed to respond correctly. And when it comes to responding, you do have a few different options available with different levels of risk and reward. Blocking is your safest option, but it has a high stamina cost and offers little additional advantage. Dodging is more risky as it sometimes needs to be timed correctly, but it consumes less stamina and can allow you to reposition into safer or more aggressive positions. Meanwhile, evading attacks through movement alone has no stamina cost, but you have less mobility and none of the iframes that dodging provides. And lastly, parrying is the highest risk option available, requiring specific timing and player knowledge of what attacks can be parried, but the reward is that you can follow up with a high damage critical hit. And so, despite the limited tools available to the player and surface level simplicity, combat still tends to feel very engaging. The stakes are high, decisions feel impactful, and the results of decisions are easy to understand, making it a perfect fit for a challenging game, as if the player understands what they did wrong, the difficulty feels like something they can overcome, no matter how great it might be. In this way, Dark Souls feels a bit like a well-meaning teacher. Deep down, it wants you to succeed, and it tries to give you the information needed to make that possible. Yes, you will die, but each death will carry a lesson. Yes, the punishments can suck, but you are always given a chance, and they can help make the lesson stick in your mind. And yes, the game can ask a lot from you, but it knows not to ask the impossible. I mean, the main punishment is the loss of souls dropped on death that you then need to recover. But really, this is only putting pressure on yourself to do something you know you're capable of, because no matter where or why you died, if you were able to get there before, you should be able to get there again. In this way, Dark Souls doesn't mind when you struggle to overcome a particular section, and it doesn't mind when you get stuck. It's only when you do worse than you did before, when you do worse than both you and Dark Souls know you're capable of, only then are your souls lost forever. Basically, Dark Souls just wants you to reach your full potential. You can't blame it for that, can you? I think this is why so many people describe Dark Souls as fair, even when the game actively tries to murder and trick you time and time again. Of course, if Dark Souls gameplay was only about knowing when to attack and how to respond to enemy attacks, this decision-making process would sooner or later stop offering much challenge. But Dark Souls keeps things fresh by constantly introducing new and varied enemy types, as well as carefully positioning enemies to ambush the player, or limiting player space to reduce both offensive and defensive options, or introducing environmental hazards that are added on top of everything else. These additions keep players on their toes, and as soon as you master one enemy type and area, players will move on and be introduced to something new. The clever part of this is that it doesn't matter what level the player's skill is, the game is still designed to match their skill level to provide a well-paced experience. This is because healing is limited through only having a set number of Estus flasks, meaning that if you haven't managed to master the current area and enemies to an acceptable level, you won't have enough healing to reach the next bonfire and gain a new checkpoint. Instead, you'll find yourself stuck at your current bonfire until you get good enough to reach the next one without running out of healing, at which point the next challenge will open up to you. I imagine many new players will experience this type of temporary roadblock in the game's first larger area, the Undead Berg, or during their first descent through Blight Town, or on their first boss fight against more than one opponent. Dark Souls wants you to master its basics before you get far enough ahead that you might truly get stuck on something you'll feel you can't overcome, because ultimately, Dark Souls does want you to overcome, bit by bit, through trial, error, persistence, skill, and anything else you have at your disposal. Still, while many foes may stand before you, there's more to mastering Dark Souls than just combat.
Dark Souls has a lot of intimidating enemies. There are bosses that tower over you, monsters that ambush you in complete darkness, creatures that inflict status effects that persist on death, and yet, the single most daunting thing that stands in your way might be the world itself. As soon as you arrive in the welcoming calm of Firelink Shrine after leaving the Undead Asylum, the player is presented with wrong ways to go. If you do journey into the skeleton-infested graveyard, or take a trip down into the darkness of New Londo, you are going to have a bad time, and there is a very good chance you will go to one or both of these places before finding the much easier route the developers surely intended new players to take. I mean, I know I went to both of these places, and I know I had a bad time when I first played this game. And this is not the only way Dark Souls allows the player to go wrong. There are other places you can wander into earlier than you'd like. You can kill important NPCs, you can consume invaluable items like Firekeeper Souls that are meant to be used for upgrading your Estus Flask, and you can get lost, get killed, get cursed, get stuck at the bottom of Blight Town with a broken weapon and a dwindling resolve. Frankly, Dark Souls is generous in the amount of ways it provides players to fuck themselves over. This is not how logic dictates games are meant to be designed. Developers should be helping players play the right way, guiding them to an enjoyable experience, safeguarding people against their direst mistakes. And yet Dark Souls goes against this, opting instead to drop players into its already dangerous world with no guidance, no direction, no safety barriers, and seemingly no concern. As many players will discover, as they beat their heads against some much too powerful skeletons, right at the opening of their grand adventure. The effect this has isn't necessarily good, but it does have an effect. Right from this game's outset, the player knows game design logic doesn't always apply, but this world isn't playing by the rules of a benevolent game developer god, and that if you want to get anywhere and make progress, you're going to have to work things out for yourself. And that can be surprisingly immersive, after all, the world is dangerous, and you are on your own, and Dark Souls makes you aware of this, which in turn impacts the way you'll play. You become cautious, observant, thoughtful, just as a person really would be if they were actually in such a dangerous situation, and this is then further encouraged and rewarded by the game's level design. Dark Souls areas don't feel like normal game levels, they twist and turn and loop back on themselves, revealing shortcuts and connections. They take advantage of verticality, often showing you places and items that you can reach, and letting you work out how to get to them. And they play with your expectations, making you question where to go, and what danger awaits for you around every corner. In a lot of ways, each area in Dark Souls is more like its own puzzle, that the player needs to solve before moving on. You need to make a mental map of their layouts as you explore their various pathways. You need to deal with a variety of unique environmental hazards, like limited space or visibility. And you need to recognize or learn from the potential pitfalls put in place by way of enemies, traps, and ambushes. Through this, Dark Souls test players are more than just their ability to fight. You need navigation and observational skills, as well as a certain amount of perseverance. But through the presence of new equipment, upgrade materials, bonfires, shortcuts, and other secrets, this process of carefully learning each area you go through is always rewarded. The high difficulty of the game makes these items and upgrades feel valuable, as players will welcome every advantage they can get. And with limited healing, and the ever-looming threat of death leading to a loss of souls, each bonfire or shortcut you find is like a gift from the gods, and represents a major, tangible milestone on your journey. The first time players will likely experience this is the ladder on the bridge in the Undead Burg, which you only reach after successfully navigating the enemy-infested streets of the Burg, and defeating the first real boss of the game, the Taurus Demon, 
and escaping dragon fire as you attempt to cross the bridge. And then, and only then, do you find that ladder leading you back to the familiar sanctuary of the bonfire. All through this sequence, tension and the player's souls are growing and growing, while your Estus charges dwindle and dwindle, making that moment when you drop down the ladder and finally realise where you are a moment full of meaning and relief. The level design combines with the limited checkpoints and healing and the dangerous enemies and environments to create these small, self-contained narrative arcs of player accomplishment, which I don't think any other game by From Software has ever managed to replicate quite so well. And this is partly because everything that can be praised about the level design in Dark Souls also applies to the world as a whole. You see, unlike in other games from the developer, Dark Souls' world is deeply interconnected. For example, Firelink Shrine itself can provide direct access to the Undead Asylum, the Undead Burg, the Undead Parish, the Catacombs, the Valley of Drakes, and New Londo, as well as quick access to Blight Town, Sen's Fortress, the Depths, and Dark Root Basin. And so, as you journey through the lands of Dark Souls, more and more routes can be found between areas, making the entire world feel intertwined and cohesive. On your first playthrough, this level of interconnectivity can seem amazing. It feels indicative of a level of detail and careful world building that you almost never see, and it provides a contextual sense of place for each location you travel to because you can visualise how each area fits into this bigger whole. And on subsequent playthroughs, this interconnectivity can provide an unrivaled sense of freedom to tackle the game's challenges in the order you choose, while also making the player feel rewarded from all the knowledge of the game they've accumulated from their time already spent with it. You'll know about upcoming bonfires, shortcuts, secrets and specific items, and you're free to use that knowledge to your advantage. Still, there is another way Dark Souls World stands apart, even from others made by the same developer, which is that there's no fast travel between bonfires until relatively late into the game. Meaning, wherever you are in the world, you're potentially stuck there, and this is a game where you can end up a long way from home. To me, this is the thing that really makes Dark Souls' sense of danger feel real. It's what makes the sense of adventure so genuine, and it's what makes the ultimate journey so captivating. The lack of fast travel also allows areas to build on top of each other without immersion-breaking interruptions to create specific experiences for the player. Like how you go from the more open and familiar streets of the Undead Burg into the much more claustrophobic, labyrinth-like layout of the Depths, which culminates in this showdown with the Gaping Dragon, a much larger, more intimidating and alien enemy than anything you've faced yet, only to then find yourself descending even deeper into somewhere even more oppressive as you make your way into Blight Town, with its hazardous walkways and constant assault from enemies that can inflict toxic and knock you to your death. And then, even at the bottom there's no reprieve, as you can't even move anywhere without wading through this poisonous swamp. And at this point, your journey to get here will have taken hours, and the prospect of running all the way back up just seems unthinkable, and yet there doesn't seem to be any end to the hazards the game throws at you, until, eventually, finally, there is. This provides an experience players will remember. On that first time through, you really don't know where you are, or where you're going, or what's waiting for you when you get there, and you can't just change your mind whenever you feel like it and teleport back to safety. You're committed to your path, and forced to deal with whatever consequences this entails. And there can be consequences. On my most recent playthrough, I was making good progress and happened to be making the descent through Blight Town. I made it to the Midway Bonfire, but didn't rest there just yet, because me, you know, being a little bit of a gamer, still had five Estus flasks remaining, so I did a little more exploring first, and then on my way back, just before using the bonfire, 
I got stuck in the floor. Now, Dark Souls isn't a perfect game, that's not the title of this video, but anyway, no big deal, I can just take the coward's way out and make the descent again. But perhaps as a result of me rushing on this second time, I died. And then I died again. And then I died a few more times. And then my weapon broke. Now, at this point, I was faced with an important decision. Do I suck it up and head back up through the depths to find a blacksmith? Or do I press on with no upgraded weapon back through this section that has already repeatedly killed me? true gamer that I am, I decide to press on. So I buy a crystal weapon from a guy I know that lives in the sewer nearby, which is a weapon with high damage, even upgraded, but low durability. And then I made the gamble that as long as I didn't die many more times, this would probably be more than enough to see me through the upcoming challenges. But then I died. And then I died again. And then I died a few more times. And then all my armor started breaking. And then my crystal weapon broke too. Long before I'd beaten the boss and rung the bell that had brought me here. Now, I think the official term for a situation like this is tilted. And it was around about now, as I sat in the middle of a great big poisonous swamp with a growing bag of broken equipment and a somewhat battered sense of pride, that I started to think I might actually be a little bit fucked if this upcoming boss was as difficult as I remember them being. What I didn't realise at this moment was that you don't actually need to defeat Quelag to make your way out of Blight Town. And so, as I was finishing up the last few bits of exploration, I was rather surprised when I stumbled into a cave that looked awfully familiar. And then, I realised where I was. One short walk to New Londo, and one little lift ride later, and I was back in Firelink Shrine, where I could not only repair, but also upgrade some things before heading off back down below. Dark Souls' lack of fast travel had allowed me to create a situation of genuine danger and tension, even though I had played this game twice before back when it first released. And then Dark Souls' highly interconnected world ended up being the thing to save my ass in the moment when I needed it the most. It was like I had just experienced my own little narrative arc, full of drama and highs and lows, and this just isn't something you would find in many other games. The way I see it is that being at Firelink Shrine is like being a ship safely in harbour, and heading off into the unknown of Dark Souls world is like casting off and setting sail, and you don't know exactly how long the journey will take, or whether the waters will be calm, or whether you have everything with you that you need, or whether you'll end up in the destination that you intend. But ultimately, you just have to go for it anyway. The game asks you to take that leap of faith, but it rewards you for doing so through the experiences this creates, and no other game, even from From Software themselves, does this anywhere near as well. In the end, mastering Dark Souls' world presents a greater challenge than even its most deadly enemies. You receive little guidance, have to journey and navigate through numerous hostile locations, are given no easy ways out of difficult situations, and you are always forced to meet this world on its own terms. And so, through the foes you face and the lands you traverse, Dark Souls asks the player to struggle, to suffer, to persevere, and ultimately, to overcome. But where does this actually get you? A major part of Dark Souls is stumbling around its world feeling lost, but if you do persist, the player will come across some more substantial guidance eventually. Ring the two bells of awakening, and the primordial serpent 
King Seeker Frampt appears before you in Firelink Shrine and offers to elucidate your fate. He tasks you with succeeding the great Lord Gwyn by linking the fire in order to cast away the dark. To do this, you must journey to the great city of Anor Londo to acquire the Lord Vessel and then collect four great souls from the same lords you hear about in the game's opening narration. Anor Londo is perhaps the game's most iconic location, and its vast scale and the player's unusual traversal route that has you journeying across rooftops, beams and buttresses do a great job at making the player feel small and out of place, all while its strange emptiness helps emphasise the fall of this once great civilization. Still, it's after this section where much of the most common criticisms of this game are placed. I can understand why this is, as these four late game locations don't always feel as high quality and enjoyable to play through as some of the game's earlier ones, but I still feel much of this criticism has been rather exaggerated. The Tomb of Giants, Lost Isolith, Duke's Archive and New Londo all feel highly distinct and memorable. They come at a time when the player has likely mastered much of the game's core combat system and has gotten used to the concept of exploring non-linear locations and dealing with enemy ambushes. And so each of these four locations seems to be designed with their own specific twist to ensure the player is still challenged and taken out of their comfort zone. For example, the Tomb of Giants reduces visibility by plunging you into near complete darkness. Lost Isolith features damaging lava and undefeatable demons. The Duke's Archive is focused around tricking the player with the unwinnable boss fight, the puzzle-like layout of its stairways, and later the invisible crystal pathways. And New Londo features enemies that move through walls and can only be harmed after using a consumable item. To me, it seems appropriate that to acquire powerful Lord Souls, the player would need to travel to even more dangerous locations and each of these places succeeds at making you feel like you're trespassing into someone else's domain. They do a good job at putting you on the back foot and making you feel like you're at a disadvantage, which helps allow the game to maintain tension and feel like it's still building to something greater. Some people have criticised these locations for their lack of interconnectivity, but you are travelling to some of this world's lowest depths and most hidden corners, so a lack of interconnectivity does have a logical explanation in this case. And seeing as how no other game of this type has come even close to replicating Dark Souls' interconnected world, it seems fairer to praise Dark Souls for how much of its world it does manage to connect, rather than criticise it for the few locations it doesn't. Still, with the four Lord Souls acquired, the way to the first flame is opened, leading to one of the most impressive vistas in the entire series. At the heart of this kiln is Lord Gwyn himself, or at least what's left of him. And if you overcome this one final obstacle, you are free, at long last, to link the first flame. As you might expect from Dark Souls, no one ever explicitly says what linking the first flame entails, and it turns out that this linking involves giving yourself to the flame, giving your life, your power, all the accumulated souls that have helped you grow over your journey that the fire will now consume as fuel to carry on burning and sustain the age of fire a little longer. This is a strange way for a game to end. There's no fanfare, no narration, no one praises you or says anything. There's not even any sign or hint of the future you've sacrificed yourself to bring about. It just fades to black as your undying character finally dies. Still, even if no one will remember your sacrifice, at least you can say that you did the right thing. Except, if the player instead ignores the directions of King Seeker Frampt, and journeys to New Londo to defeat the Four Kings before placing the Lord Vessel, you can meet Darkstalker Calf, another primordial serpent, who gives a very different account of this world's events. Calf proclaims that humans are linked to the Dark as a result of the Dark Soul claimed by our ancestors. 
he goes on to say that the fading of the flame and encroaching darkness will actually lead to an age of man, and that the great Lord Gwyn has in fact manipulated events to trick future humans into linking the flame against their actual best interests. In effect, Karth is telling you that everything you thought you knew about man, darkness, the first flame and Gwyn is actually all wrong. His solution is to let the flame fade, and instead use your power to rule this new age as a dark lord, which you can do by giving him the lord vessel instead of Frampt, and completing the rest of the game as normal, where you simply walk away after defeating Gwyn instead of linking the flame. There is no actual way to know which of these remarkably similar looking and sounding primordial serpents is telling you the truth, if even one of them is. And with this revelation, what little concrete knowledge the player was given about this world and their purpose has been taken from them, leaving you unable to determine what is right or wrong, and what the point of everything was. The irony here is that if you didn't go searching for more answers, you wouldn't have these questions. After all, Karth is well hidden, meaning players are very unlikely to find him on their own, and the normal ending of Linking the Flame provides a bittersweet yet satisfying conclusion, one that suggests there is hope for the future in a way that still fits with the game's overall somber tone. Instead though, your reward for trying to understand more is to understand less, while having your previously heroic journey robbed of all its heroism. You might hope then that answers would be more forthcoming in the sequels. After all, Dark Souls seems designed to reward player perseverance, as if it wants to encourage players to never give up despite how hard things get. And so, maybe the answers are out there, and you just need to play more games, read more item descriptions, and link more flames. And yet, Dark Souls 2's narrative answers nothing, and instead focuses on your futility, making it clear that the linking and fading of the first flame is all just part of a cycle, one that has happened again and again, and one that will keep on happening as flames will always fade. The secret ending for this game even says in its narration that it's our fate to insatiably seek a path that doesn't even exist. Uh, not to worry, one more game to go, and let's be real. Of course, Dark Souls 2 doesn't provide any real answers, it's just the middle part of a trilogy. And then we get to Dark Souls 3, and what do you know? It is different, because instead of just the same cycle repeating once more, this time the cycle has gone a bit wrong. The one chosen to link the flame in this age, Prince Lothric, has refused. And the undead curse has not managed to provide a chosen undead to do the duty either. And so, in an act of desperation, the flame itself has resurrected great lords of the past, people who did once link the flame in their own age, to collect the lord souls and link the flame once more. And yet, these lords of Cinder also turn out to be unwilling. And with no one worthy left to call upon, the flame is then forced to turn to the unworthy. This is who you play as, an unkindled, one who tried to link the flame in their own age, but failed, and so was never fully consumed by the fire. And as you go through the same old motion of journeying across dangerous lands to defeat bosses and collect Lord Souls, it becomes clearer and clearer that this cycle of linking the flame is coming to its end, regardless of what you or it think about this. The world is quite literally running out of people to save it. Amongst its current inhabitants, it's very hard to find anyone who still seems to care and in its attempt to continue, this world is just becoming more corrupted and distorted, to the point where the land around the first flame is actively collapsing in on itself in a state of entropic decay, reflective of the age of fire as a whole. 
Dark Souls 1 was the first repeat of this cycle, and it seems like Dark Souls 3 is meant to be the last. And sure, you can still link the flame, but in doing so, it responds with nothing but a faint whimper that is a far cry from the roaring flames the player sees in the first game. And so, it seems it is finally time to let the fire fade. Not because the Age of Darkness would be better, but because the Age of Fire is simply unable to continue. The flame has run out of fuel, and you can either let its embers slowly fade, or hasten events by putting them out safely. And yet, when you do that, you hear this. The first flame quickly fades. Darkness will shortly settle. But one day, tiny flames will dance across the darkness. Like embers linked by Lord's Pass. By Dark Souls standards, this is about as definitive and direct as explanations ever get. And what it says is that the Age of Darkness will simply lead to another Age of Fire. Possibly even the exact same Age of Fire. I mean, the Age of Ancients is only a name given to that time by those who came after and it was described as a time where the world was grey and unformed, which sounds a lot like a world of ash. The presence of arch trees and dragons don't disprove this either. In Dark Souls 3, there are a lot of examples of new trees seemingly growing within this ashen world, and Arch Dragon Peak seems to suggest that some people might be turning into dragons. Regardless, it seems indisputable that fire will follow darkness, and thus, Dark Souls' story is concluded. This effectively means that all endings, across all games, are basically the same ending, and anything the player might do doesn't matter, and it never did. Link the flame or walk away at the end of Dark Souls 1, and it changes nothing, Dark Souls 2 still happens regardless, proving that even if you didn't link the flame, someone else did. The same is true in Dark Souls 2, for it will always lead into Dark Souls 3, and in Dark Souls 3, every ending, secret or not, still shows that darkness will soon be upon us, and that darkness will simply lead into an age of fire all over again. And that's it, that's the end of Dark Souls. Every ending is the same ending, nothing you did ever mattered, and it's all just pointless. The inhabitants of Dark Souls world are going hollow. You might think this is because of the undead curse, the dark sign, the fading flame and the encroaching darkness, but it's not. These things would cause everyone to hollow when the fire does finally fade, but that hasn't happened yet. Instead, the reason they go hollow is because in the face of this impending doom, they give up. They become resigned to their fate with no reason to continue, and hollowing is the result. This is shown by the various fates of the game's many NPCs. These characters have different motivations. Some are on missions, some have someone to protect, some search for knowledge, adventure, answers, purpose, and yet almost all of them meet the same end. They go hollow after losing their reason or motivation to continue, sometimes as a direct result of the player's own actions or immediately after they achieve their initial goal. This is the same situation the player's character is in. 
It doesn't matter how many times you die, or how you might look, your character will not go hollow. They will never go hollow, as long as you keep trying. The first flame may well be fading, but it is happy to wait for you as long as that might take, so long as you keep playing the game. But if you instead give up, this becomes the moment your character hollows, just like how it happens with everyone else in this world, and this becomes the moment the first flame finally fades, as the light of your TV screen fades to black for the last time. In this way, the experience of the player and their character are in sync. You are a part of the game's story, and it's your resolve that's being tested, just like how it is for every other inhabitant of this world. And the game does try to test that resolve of yours. You're dumped in a bleak, hostile, dying world with little explained and less understood, where the game then tries to kill you over and over again, taking your souls, wasting your time, and always asking you, do you really have what it takes? Are you really going to keep going? Are you sure you wouldn't just prefer to turn the game off and roll over and hollow alongside everyone else? And it's left up to you how you respond to this. But if you do choose to persist, you will eventually find yourself rising to the game's challenges, both as a result of the game's more encouraging than it might initially seem design, and as a result of your own hard work. This is the real reason why we succeed on our journey after all. We are not the most powerful or skillful warrior around. I mean, if the player only had one life, they wouldn't get far, and sure, you defeat many powerful bosses, but most of these bosses also defeat you, possibly many times. It's only because you get back up again and keep trying that you're able to accomplish the things you do in this game. It is only through perseverance. And this is what Dark Souls is about. It wants you to feel challenged, lost and intimidated, and then it wants you to overcome all this through perseverance. This is the true story of Dark Souls, and it's one that is told through its world, its gameplay, its mechanics, and most important of all, the player themselves. However, this story of perseverance and overcoming is ultimately reflected by the game's broader narrative as well. Dark Souls presents the player with a world and story that's confusing, where the player feels lost, where details don't always make sense, where hope is fading, where the world is always dying, and where it's ultimately hard to claim that anything the player ever does matters. And then, it challenges you to find meaning in it anyway, in spite of the pointlessness and the struggle, and in defiance of this inevitable end shared by all things that the fading flame represents. Dark Souls forces you to find your own meaning, and players do, whether through the satisfaction of overcoming challenges, or through each other and the shared experiences created through memes, messages and more, or through the search of knowledge and exploring the depths of the game's lore to find every answer that is out there, or through creation, which can allow this world and the experiences it creates to live on elsewhere, or through plain, old, simple fun. And is any of this really so different to our own lives? One day, you will die and so will everyone else who ever lives. One day, all life will end, all knowledge will be forgotten, all stars will fade, and eventually the universe itself will reach a state where entropy can no longer increase, and the heat death of all things will commence, ending all that ever was or could be. The flame always fades, and we live our lives aware of this. One day, you will die, and that's probably something you think about sometimes. I know I do. 
It's not that easy being alive. It's not easy finding meaning in an inherently meaningless world. It's not always easy to justify continuing in the face of our struggles and suffering. It's not easy living a life where we always have to face death. But we do, because it is simply a part of being alive, in Dark Souls' world and our own. There are some things that are beyond our control. The flame always fades. For most of us though, we still choose to continue onwards regardless. In this way, Dark Souls explores many of our deepest human concerns. Why are we here? Why do we suffer? How do we find meaning in our existence? How do we accept that one day we will die? And so on. What Dark Souls doesn't do is provide definitive answers to these problems, but really, no game ever could, and no answer may even be out there. Still, what Dark Souls does do is provide space for us to create our own answers, and I think that is enough. After all, that is about as much as we get in our own lives as well. Dark Souls is a game which defined a generation. It single-handedly created a positive association with difficulty within gaming, it left a legacy on the industry that is still being loudly heard to this day, and it did all this not through having the highest budget, the longest development, or the largest team working on it, but rather through a steadfast commitment to its own vision. Dark Souls breaks so many rules of game design that its world stops feeling like a game and becomes a place of danger, adventure and discovery. Its high difficulty masterfully walks a line between challenging players while still making sure they always feel like they can overcome these challenges. Its levels and world design offer a sense of genuine exploration that is almost unrivaled, and as for that world, its interconnectivity and cohesion make it stand completely unique even amongst other games of the genre it created. And to top it all off, there is a level of detail to this world that this video has barely even hinted at. It is a place built from the ground up with care and consideration in how every single piece should fit into the larger whole, and that larger whole is always aligned with the game's themes and its broader meaning. And in a time when so many games use so many words to say so little, Dark Souls stands as a testament to how the entire game can be used to tell its story, and how if you do it well enough, you won't even need players to read or understand a single word for them to still feel like they get it. If you ever wanted to win the argument of whether games can be considered art, Dark Souls is your path to an easy victory. That said, it's not as art that I think Dark Souls should best be remembered, but rather as the champion of games as an experience. Dark Souls takes you places, it makes you feel emotions, and it asks you questions that you may well still be grappling with for years and years to come. And that's why Dark Souls is underrated. Thank you for watching my video. Hello, the video is over. Now, you might be thinking that it took a while for me to make this, and that clearly this never knows best guy is just getting lazy now that he's sold out and took the big sponsor money, but that's not true. The lazy part, anyway, because I actually have made another video recently, it's just on a different channel because it's not about video games. That said, it is, in my opinion, a good video, all feedback on it has been very positive, and so if you want more content, or you just feel like, you know, being nice, go check it out, I'll put a link on screen. It's about the ways that people are lied to and manipulated about people's appearance, and you should watch it, it would make me happy if it got more views.
Otherwise, the next video is going to be about a little unknown indie game I found out about recently. Uh, it's called Elden Ring.